um, basically what I want to talk about today or for this particular uh, project is is looking forward and saying, if we are going to build some wonderful tools using all of our awesome technology, uh, what do we actually have to think about when we take those tools and try to deploy them for clinicians and patients, right? So so how do these tools and what, what do we need to put into the tools in order for them to be taken up in a positive manner or a helpful manner for everybody or, or, or um, for as many as possible? So right now, uh, AI is being applied towards uh, mental health in a few different ways. So uh, a large, uh, there's quite a few systems out there that'll do patient stratification, basically saying you're a very high risk or you're a suicide risk. Uh, you're a low risk or you have these types of uh, disorders. There's um, the usage around uh, care quality. So are you, um, have you received care that has taken you forward a step um, versus are you left in a dark room by yourself for a long period of time? Uh, there are some that are actually delivering cognitive behavioral therapy um, in, a, in a very step-by-step -step manner. And then there are chats and check-ins through AI. And the idea here is that, um, so socio-technical perspective is basically that uh, we, people, uh, our behaviors and our interactions and, our, and how we use the technology will change the technology itself because we're putting different and new data into the system by our use of the technology. And then obviously the technology um, impacts individuals, right? So how the technology is deployed, how it's configured to run, and, and the assumptions that it makes and how it will be used impacts individuals. And so there's this loop here. It's the socio-technical loop. <clears throat> and the idea is that you need to look at the entire thing as a system, not just the technology by itself and not just how people use it by itself, but kind of how they work together in order to create the best possible system overall. Right? Uh, and so... A lot of, <clears throat> there's quite a bit of work from the technology perspective, or I kind of think of it as the top-down perspective, where um, people are saying, look, we have these AI frameworks, particularly around um, ethical frameworks or guidelines for how we should create and deploy technology in the healthcare setting um, from a high level and guideline perspective. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, and in general, there are kind of eight-ish, very high-level principles that, um, that are coming out. And, and in fact, we saw in ours, the top seven came out from our work as well. So privacy, accountability, safety, security, transparency, fairness and non-discrimination is a big one, um, control of the technology, and professional responsibility. So these are things that are kind of from a top-down perspective saying these are really important um, as we build the technology. And what we wanted to look at is from a bottom-up perspective. So we actually go talk to people. Do we get the same um, concerns, right? So that as we go back and build, um, are, we, are we actually building the right thing in our, in, our, um, in our design and how we deploy it? So what we did, um, obviously, we have ethics approval for this, um, and we actually undertook this in two different ways. So in the first, we created a pilot study where we were actually talking to clinical staff um, and also service users. So this is both clinicians and patients, although we spoke to them separately. Um, at It's called a Varied Recovery, which is a UK and Welsh charity for mental health that provides services uh, and mental health treatment. And we used it to... Um, uh, to create two different things. So one was a set of surveys that were given to patients and clinicians, and the other one was a set of interviews and focus groups um, across 32 individuals um, to identify how they were interacting with the technology and what was important to them. And then all the responses, both for surveys and the interviews, were thematically encoded and presented here. So in particular, the pieces that we were looking for as we were coding this was around anonymy, confidentiality, patient choice, particularly equity and bias, and then some of the values of creation, right? So how the safety, the quality of the tools themselves. 
I'm going to put up a lot of quotes because I think they're really important from a, um, we are, I think, all technologists who are kind of building and designing these tools. And I think it's really important for us to understand and hear from the words, um, basically what people really worry about. And uh, so these are examples that, that uh, were repeated over and over and over again thematically. Um, and there's concern about both security, but also transparency. So people wanted to know where their information was going. They wanted to know what information a clinician had as they were um, interacting, being treated. Okay. They, <laughs> but from a, you know, I went into this thinking, oh, of course, everybody's going to worry about transparency and security of their information. And they're going to hate the AI because it's this black box. And actually, one of some of the striking things came out of this was that actually the patients, in many cases, really appreciated that the black box, that the, the AI was a black box. Um, so, for example, we actually had a patient in the group, actually it was the patient's mother in the group, um, who was so happy there was an AI in this because the, the, the last clinician happened to go to a bar and was having drinks and saying, you know, I saw this person today, I can't tell you their name, blah, 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 blah. And indeed, this person was outed in a small town. And this will never happen with an AI. Who are they going to have drinks with? Um, so, um, so yeah, so, so there was, there's a surprising amount of appreciation of the fact that it was not a clinical therapist behind the black box. Um, because there are certain rules, and they guarantee that those rules will be met. Um, so there's, there is, on both sides, um, a worry about uh, um, autonomy. So um, both that they are worried that personal data has to be logged for these tools, but also just to make sure in, in, um, that it is treated appro appropriately for GDPR, right? And the assumption here is that we as designers will um, do that, but then how do we convey that information to the users? Again, it was interesting to me. So um, there were about half and half. So some, you know, about half the patients were saying, oh, I would never want to talk to an AI how would I know that it's giving me the right information um, and not walking me off of, of a pier? But there were quite a few around um, who really appreciated that they had a choice within their, in their world. So they could access it whenever they wanted, whenever they felt they needed it. Um, and it provided a service in a way that, uh, especially so this is this was done in the UK and our our health system is somewhat overloaded this, at this point in time and so it was a way to get service without uh, a long wait um, there's it, this is actually some of the new pieces that came out and this is that people actually wanted to engage with the AI um, that they didn't actually want to talk to a human. They wanted to be in a quiet room by themselves and not have that social dynamic between them and a human to also manage in support of their service. Um, however, a few of them said, by the way, there should obviously be backup. And if I want to talk to somebody, there should be somebody there. In terms of equality and bias, it was, as I said, a double-edged sword here. So um, there was the the feeling that we could um, create a larger chasm in the class divide, that uh, if, they, if, they, if somebody has money to pay for a human therapist, they will pay for a human therapist. And if they don't, they get put in line for um, the generic chat, right? Um, however, the other side has the same problem. So uh, a lot of these technologies require access to um, what often we consider now fundamental and basic machine access internet, which is not necessarily the case. So there's, there's kind of a gap or a chasm felt on either side. So the, the very, very vulnerable on one side who don't even have access to equipment, as well as um, the rich who can effectively buy themselves out into whatever type of service they want. Um, yeah, 
So uh, this is this was continued. Basically, you would not go to a library and use a public machine to access a mental health service. And so by doing this or by saying that we're going to build a technology that does this, we have to think through how it's deployed and how it can be deployed in a setting that even if somebody doesn't have a computer or a smartphone, um, could access it <laughs> within um, with public services. What was interesting was, you know, there was um, what I expected to come out of this, and it, it did not. Was uh, so there's you know there's always concern about AI and AI biases, um, and actually the patients within this uh, group turned that on its head, and they were very aware of clinical biases and the biases of. Uh, therapists reacting as a human to them, um, and uh, um, and were actually very happy with an AI who they felt may in some cases be less biased. Um, on the other hand, they acknowledge that the AI is only as good as the as the team that puts it together. And if that team itself doesn't understand the intricacies of mental health, um, it is unlike to, unlikely to service the needs appropriately. I'm going to flip through this um, since many of these are are kind of obvious, and and many, much of this goes. Um, how do we ensure that there's a correctness of treatment, um, that that the AI itself isn't going to go off the rails and start spouting um, problematic information back? Uh, yeah, a along with safety. So. Um, is it appropriate for a professional setting yet? And how do you actually measure that? We'll go through. Um, yeah, these are all in the paper, so you can read it. I wanted to get to the conclusion, so because it, it was striking to me, right? So you get a lot of news and, and flash around, you know people worried about AI. And, and it turns out that actually there's quite a few um, pieces identified that were positive from both the clinicians and the service users. And that was reduced waiting times, they can get it whenever they wanted, and they had choice about how they were going to engage with it. Um, but particularly for our community, some of the things that we need to think about as we're building the AIs, um, how do you make sure that um, you are reaching out to a large audience, right? That you're not worried about, so either digital literacy or how people engage with the technology itself that's not limiting. Um, or, I'm sorry, I have technology. How do you make sure that uh, a development team does not establish their bias within the tool? Um, and finally, that uh, how, how can we ensure basically that an AI doesn't deliver responses that are not quite as carefully tailored to a user's needs? And how do you measure that as you're building the system? So these are the pieces that, um, that came out from effectively a bottom-up evaluation as opposed to a, a general guidelines around how do we deploy AI systems into a healthcare setting. Thank you.